Let me just turn the Bible to Psalm 55. It says, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplication. Attend unto me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint. And make a noise. Because of the voice of the enemy. Because of the oppression of the wicked. For they cast iniquity upon me. And in wrath. They hate me. My heart is so pained within me. And terrors of death are falling. Upon me. Fearfulness and trembling. Are come upon me. And horror. Has overwhelmed me. And I said. Oh that I had wings. Like a dove. For then would I fly away. And be at rest. There is an old song on that. It's not for this generation. Eh? <laughs> Lo, then would I wander far off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues. For I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night, they go about it upon the walls thereof. Mischief also and sorrow are in the midst of it. Wickedness is in the midst thereof. Deceit and guile depart not from their street, from her streets. For it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man, my equal, my guide, and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God, onto the house of God in company. Let death seize upon them and let them go them quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall do what? Save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He had delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me for there were many with me God shall hear and afflict them even he that abideth of old because they have no changes therefore they fear not God he had put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him he had broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. I hope you know he's talking about the betrayal of a familiar friend. All right. But war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. 
Everybody read. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee, and he shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. But what we've read so far would actually present a picture of a righteous who is being moved. Huh? Yeah, that's the picture. But you see, what I'm trying to help us see is that although the righteous was going through a terrible situation like that, he wasn't moved. And so that you are passing through a situation of great concern does not necessarily mean that you have failed. Are you still here with me? That means in the midst of it, you can still take a stand huh, for the Lord, with the Lord, and the Lord will stand by you, and victory is sure to be your portion. Amen. Amen. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He had a burden. And he's narrated his burden. And it was time for him to hand it over to him, to the Lord. And he did. And the promise is that he shall never allow, the word suffer means he shall never allow the righteous to be displaced. He shall never allow the righteous to be moved. Yes. But thou, O God, shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live uh, shall not live out half their days, he says, but I will trust in thee. Verse 16. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall do what? Save me. Let's read that one more time. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. So where is your salvation? In the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 6. So I'm going to read not every verse, but, you know, probably just read like one, two, three, and then we'll skip to another portion and read another portion uh, to the end of, of this chapter. It says, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God. How? What that means is that there is a possibility that people can receive the grace of God and the grace of God not profit them. Is that right? Uh -huh. But there is a way to receive grace and grace profits you. And what is the desire of God? Your profit or that you do not profit? Your profit. And, um, and, and that's exactly what uh, the prophet Isaiah said when he uh, uh, prophesied and said of the Lord, speaking on behalf of the Lord, I am the Lord, your redeemer. Um, I teach you that you may profit. So he says, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Um, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, because... Typically, when an individual offends uh, or commits a sin, uh, because he is not 
alone and he is a part of a body. His sin is reckoned as the sin of the body. Um, just like some people will say, oh, it, it, one pastor did this. And then you hear another one did that. And the next thing that comes out is that is how they are. And that's why you have to be very careful how you live. Because your life smears the body. Or brings profit, honor to the body. So he says, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. But let's see if we can just read one or two more here. But in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love without hypocrisy. That's what that means, love unfeigned. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true. As unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold we live. As chastened and not killed. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. As poor yet making many rich. As having nothing yet possessing all things. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. I've ended up reading the whole thing, right? Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own boils. Now, for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children. Be ye also enlarged. It is from this point that I want us to pay particular attention. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So is he encouraging that there has to be a clear distinction between believers and unbelievers? Huh? Yeah. He says, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. Everybody complete that with me. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So let's stop here for a bit, for a while. Now, I'd like you to back up to verse... 14, let's identify ourselves. And be ye, so when he says be ye, who is he talking to? The church, right? All right, so for now, this is being addressed to whom? To you. Say to me. So we want to pick out what you are, who you are, right? So he says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That means that it, the scripture does not consider you an 
unbeliever. Are you right? All right. Or is that right? All right. So what is the Bible calling you here? Now let me hear it out loud. I'd like to say, I am a believer. All right. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? So who is the unrighteous one here? The believer or the unbeliever? So who are you? Your righteousness. That's what he's referring to here now. So I'm a believer and I'm righteous. And then he says, and what communion had light with darkness? Who is considered darkness here? The unbeliever. So let's just, let us say so far who you are in Christ. One, I'm a believer. Two, I'm righteous. Three, I am light. Is that okay? Let's say it again. I am a believer. I am righteous. I am light. I'd like you to say it again. I'd like you to say it again. And it is very important that we remind ourselves who we are, understand who we are, and constantly say to ourselves, reminding ourselves who we are in Christ. In Christ, I'm a believer. In Christ, I am righteous. In Christ, I am light. But he's not done. Let's see, next verse, 15. It says, and what concord had Christ with Belial? So who is he referring to as Christ here? You. Why? Because you are one with him. Are you following this? All right. So I would rather just say that I am one with Christ. You know, yeah. And then he says, and what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Yeah, I'm a believer. 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with what? Idols. So who is regarded here as the temple of God? You are. Let us see. Let's start again and see how many things that we identify that we are. Because there's a reason why I need us to go through all of this. Yes? First, I'm a believer. I'm righteous. I'm light. I'm one with Christ. I am the temple of God. And then he says, for ye are the temple of the living God. Emphasizing who you are. You are the temple of the living God. The dwelling place of the most high God. The place where God resides. Now that means that because of who you are, God is never absent. Are you following this? And why is he never absent? Because you are the one who is housing him. And that means that anywhere you go, who goes with you? Why? Because he dwells in you. He dwells in you. And if I understand that he dwells in me, then I also understand that I can never be alone. Are you following this? And he made a promise in the book of Hebrews, or just quoting uh, 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 his promises in the book of Hebrews. He says, Lo, I will be with you always. Always means what? Always. I am with you always. Always means that God never steps away from you. He's always there. Because he lives in you. Amen. He says, as God had said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. So we the people of God are believers. We are his house. We are one with him. We are light. We are righteous. He dwells in us. He walks. In us. Verse 17. 
says, wherefore, continue, from among whom? The infidel, the unbelievers, from among idols, right? Come out from among Belial, the, those who belong to the devil, right? Come out from among the unrighteous. Come out from, from among those considered as what? Darkness. Now, the reason why he says wherefore, wherefore means because of who you are. Consequent on who you are in Christ, this is where you should be, how you should live. Hence, he started by saying, never compare yourselves with them. Never yoke yourself with them. Because whatever yoke that you have with the unrighteous is an unequal yoke, an unbalanced yoke. It is not a workable yoke. The essence of yoking is to increase efficiency. Right? That's the essence of yoking. It's to increase efficiency. So you, you are actually employing the power of synergy. Now, but if the yoke is unequal, and let us see how unequal this yoke is, you can't move in the same direction. You can't say the same things. You do not believe the same things. You do not have the same values. Their experiences are not your experiences. Even if you're passing through the same situation, there is salvation for you. There is none for them because the Bible says they are in the world without God and without hope, but you are in the world with God indwelling you, walking in you, and you always have hope. Like the prophet Isaiah said, fear not their fear and call not a confederacy what they call a confederacy. And that's also why the scripture says when they say there is a casting down, you are saying something different. How do I yoke myself? And expect to be efficient in my work with God. What the Bible is saying is, you will not be. Let's go back to verse 16. It says, as God had said, I will, that's a promise, dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. I will dwell in them and walk in them. Can you give that to me in, in another translation? I want to see how it puts that promise of God. Good news. Says, how can God's temple come to terms with pagan idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God himself has said, I will make my home 
with my people and live among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Let, let me have it in another one. No, no, no. I, I think I'll prefer amplified. I want to see how amplified is going to amplify that. He says, even as God said, I will dwell uh, in and with and among them, and we walk in and with and among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Pretty much the same thing. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Is your path with God set? You have no answer? Yeah. Who is setting the terms of the relationship? God, not you. What, what's your portion in this relationship? Huh? To follow, to comply, to yield to his will. All right. Should I accept and expect God to do what he says he will do? All right. Do you realize that when we read Psalm 55, that all the things that the psalmist experienced, all the traumas that he experienced, were not part of the assigned will of God to him? Right? Or oh, you don't know that? Let me ask you, let me put it this way. His will for you is divine health. Are you following this? All right. Can you pray to God to save you from his will? No, talk to me now. Yeah. Did you say yes? You said no, so I'm, I know it's no you are saying. God's will is your prosperity, scripture says. Can you pray to God to deliver you from prosperity? No, talk to me. God's will is that you never lack counsel. That is, you are never left in a place where you are in a dilemma. You do not know what to do, where to turn, how to go, what to say. Now, that situation is contrary to the will of God. Is that right? All right. So now, you know, everything is just going smoothly. I have counsel. I have direction. I have guidance. I know exactly what it is. Then at some point in time, I stop and I say, Lord, I want to test my prayer powers. Deliver me from counsel. Deliver me from your guidance. Will God respond to that? No, because he doesn't hear nor will he answer any prayer that is not consistent with his will. Are you following this? Psalm 55. Did the psalmist pray for God to save him? Yes, he did. So he couldn't have been asking God to save him from his will. From God's will. It's not possible. Are you following this? I want to be poor, Lord. I want to be sad. I want to be depressed. I want to suffer. Uh, I, want, I want the enemy to overcome me. I want, you know, I want to be diseased. I want to, that prayer will not be heard. Come, listen to me. Are you listening to what I'm trying to help you say? What did I say? That prayer will not be heard. Why will it not be heard? Because it is not consistent with the will of God. And because God does not release his power in the direction of what is not his will. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11 says, He works all things after the counsel of his own will. So God responds only to the advice of his will. 
Now, I'm trying to help you to understand your position in Christ and how you ought to move forward with him. Your relationship with God is based on his terms. His terms express his will. So if you want to prosper in your relationship with God, you must first learn what God's will is and comply. And comply. And what that means also is that if you want that relationship to prosper and for you to enjoy your fellowship with God, you must be prepared to do away with anything that is not consistent with the will of God. Anything that is not consistent with the will of God, do away with it. Even if you like it, do away with it. Even if you want it, do away with it. I don't, are you following this? So in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he begins to tell us what should not interfere with your relationship with God. 17. Wherefore, Because of my clearly expressed will. Because of what I have made you to be. And what is that? I desire to dwell in you and to walk in you. But I cannot dwell in the midst of unrighteousness. So first, you became a believer. I made you righteous. I made you a light. Now you belong to Christ. And I have designed you as my temple. To fulfill my desire, which is to dwell and walk in and among you. So now that you know who you are, now that you understand what my will is, come out from among them, he says. And be ye separate, saith Pastor OJ. Saith Heritage Assembly. Saith your close friend. Saith your parents. Say it to your wife. Say it to your husband. Are you following this? So if this is God's word, then that means that this is what God desires or is instructing that the righteous, the believer, those he considers as light and belonging to him to do. If you don't do it, then your war is against the will of God. Then you set yourself contrary to the will of God. And the Lord said, let us make man in our own image. And after our own likeness, the next verse says, and God created man in his own image and likeness. He already designed him that way. And the Bible says he blessed them. Meaning that he wasn't just talking of the male man, but both of them. 
and said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And I put everything under you, subdue all things. Dress the garden, make of it what you want. But you see, there is a tree in the garden that I do not want you to eat of. But of everything else, feel free. Was that God's word to Adam and Eve? Did an enemy come against Adam and Eve? No. Thank you. The enemy came against the word. Why did he come against the word? Because he knows that if he allows the word to be sown, the word will grow and produce fruit. And the fruit will be profitable to men. So he did not want men to profit from the word. The instruction of God. And then he said, hath God said. Now let me ask you, hath God said, wherefore come out from among them? Hath God said, be ye separate? The Bible says, saith who? The Lord. And he didn't stop there. He said, and touch not the unclean thing. What did God say next? And I will receive you. Who is this? message for the believer thank you who is this message written to the righteous who is this message giving direction to the light which house is God protecting by this message his temple now is this temp is this Message, this instruction that is given, going to in any way affect the relationship between God and the believer, God and the righteous? Huh? Yes. How do I know that? Because God said so. What did he say? And I will receive you. What does that mean by implication? If you do not do this, I cannot receive you. Is that right? Plain and simple. Plain and simple. And then Eve began to see reason why she should not exactly mm, obey God fully. Bible says, and as she considered it, she saw that it was it was good. So the eye is it a fruit that will make you wise. And notice that what the enemy said to her was that you will be like God. You will be like you already are. I need joy in my life. And the only way to have that joy is to compromise a little bit. To You understand what I'm trying to help you see? But do you realize that for every born again child of God, there is joy unspeakable and full of glory that is resident already inside? And that that joy is not based on your feelings? Or based upon the things that happen around you. Now, the way to connect to the joy that the Lord has already invested or deposited in you is by faith. In this grace wherein we stand. 
It's by faith. It's by faith. There is joy. That's the reason why you find we often say things like joy stealers. How does a situation, a condition, steal what is not there already? You only steal from something that is already, am I right? The Bible says, in the tents of the righteous, and I am the righteous, there will be rejoicing always. There's joy in my heart. Rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. You make that connection by faith. You make that connection by faith. Oh, I, 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 I want to enjoy success, you know, in everything. I want my, my fruit to be harvested in a season. Then the Bible tells us in Psalm 1, which is not different from what we are reading now, blessed is the man who walks not Who sits not? Who stands not? But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he do what? Meditate day and night. The Bible says whatsoever that man does. The counsel by which you should live your life should not be what the world says. Should not be how the world sees things. They live, speak, and desire. Theirs is evidence-based, but the evidence is senses, sensual evidence-based. You, as a believer, you live based on the superior evidence. Faith is the substance of things what? Hoped for. And of things, your evidence is not visible. But in the world, the evidence has to be seen. Are you following this? And until we are able to change our focus and not think like the world and begin to think as the word says... We will not experience what is assigned us. The way of darkness and the way of light are not the same. The way of righteousness and the way of unrighteousness are not the same. We cannot borrow from the world to run in the word. You cannot borrow from darkness to live in the light. You're distinct. And I will receive you, he says. And when I receive you, he goes on to tell us exactly what he's going to do. Verse 18. And I will be a father unto you and you ye shall be my sons and daughters saith who? saith the Lord Almighty. Who is this Lord Almighty? This is Jesus. How do you know that? We spent some time on this in School of the Word some many weeks back. That's who he is. The Lord Almighty. This is Jesus. And I will be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, say the Lord. And when he says this, he's not necessarily just talking about now. He's talking about ultimately. He's talking about ultimately. 
Because there is an adoption coming which has not happened yet. And that adoption is a spirit, soul, and body in perfection. That is the direction in which this is speaking. But let's look at something just as quickly as possible. Um, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, let's see. Yeah. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which did what? Pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, now look at this. It says, behold, he cometh with clouds. We'll come back here. First John 3. Behold, he cometh. Behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, is that what Revelation 1 verse 7 is addressing? Yes. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Why? Why? For we shall see him as he is. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 8. I am Alpha and who? Omega, the beginning and the ending. Saith who? The same Lord who said for you to come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. Same Lord, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to, and which is to come. Who? Revelation 22, 15. Yeah. So let's start from 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, who obey his instructions. What instructions? Come out from among them. Be ye separate. Are you following this? And touch not the unclean thing. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. And may enter in through which gate? The gates into the city which 21 described. For without, that is outside, who are those who are outside? So a clear, a clear distinction between those who we come in and those who are outside. So you read. Yes. Start again. Read on. I who, I who, yes, have sent my messenger, yes, these things where, does that include you? All right, yes. I am the root. Let him take of the water of life freely. So let's go back to Revelation 21. Verse 5. 
Read. And he that did what? Sat upon the throne, said, Behold, I make how many things? Yes. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. So who does he say he will be God to? The overcomers. Who did he say will be his son? The overcomers. This is the direction in which 2 Corinthians chapter 6 was speaking. Let me just help you to understand the ways of the devil. God gave his word to Adam and Eve and Satan came against it. And Jesus, you know, in a parable explained. And, and, and let's see, Matthew 13 and verse 4. He says, and when he sowed, the sower went forth to sow seeds. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about all of it, but I just want us to see this. And when he sowed, he told us much later while he was interpreting that the seed was the word of God. So we understand that it was the word of God that the sower went forth to sow. Some seeds fell by the wayside. And who came? The fowls came and did what? Devoured them. In his interpretation, Jesus Christ said, the fowls are devils who come to steal the word from our hearts so that we don't obey it, so that we don't build our lives on the word. They come and steal it. Genesis chapter 15. A little bit of a long read, but not so long. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, saying I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus, and Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord. What came? The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own boils shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be, numerous, countless. What did Abraham do? Was he a believer? He became a believer. <laughs> and Abraham believed in the Lord. What did God do? He counted it to him for righteousness. How, how do we become righteous in Christ? The Bible says, with the heart, man believeth unto what? Righteousness. So, this is, would we say that from this moment, Abraham became Righteous 
Yes, that's what the Bible says. It was counted. His, his righteousness was imputed unto him. He received the gift of righteousness. So he stood with God. Now he was discussing with God from a new position. He was a believer. He had become righteous with the righteousness of God. By faith. Let's compare this. Romans chapter 4. Let's see what the Bible says. Let's read from verse 20. He says of Abraham, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was what? Imputed to him for what? Righteousness. Is that what we just read? Yes. Let's read on. Now, it was not written for whose sake? Abraham's sake only. That it was imputed to him. But for whose sake? For us, for us also. To whom it shall be imputed if we do what believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification what does it mean to be justified to be made righteous Genesis let's go back and continue from where we stopped. So God made a promise to Abraham. Abraham believed and righteousness was reckoned to his charge or to his account. Verse 6, 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the ore of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, take me and Hypha of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the mist. What does that mean when you say you divide them in the mist? Yeah, parted them in the middle. Right? All right. And laid each piece one against the other. That means he cut it in the middle, put one to the left, put one to the right. Are you following this? Now what will be in between the two? Blood. Right? Pouring forth from the two parts. Because you put one here, you put one here, you put another here, you put another there, you put another there, you put another there. And it will be blood in the middle of it. Let's return again. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece against one another. But the birds divided he not. And read. When who came? When the word was sown, what came? Same fowls came down upon the carcasses. What happened to Abraham? Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. The reason for this was because God was about to come. That was like unto one falling under the power. Like unto. Because of the awesome manifestation of God's presence breaking forth. 
Just like it was when, when God said, bring them to the mountain so that I can introduce myself to them. And when they came, there was great shaking. It's an earthquake, thunder, lightning. And the people were horrified by the manifestation of God's presence because they thought that God was all soft and gentle. Like many of us think. Oh, God is so sweet. Oh, God is so loving, so merciful, so kind. Yes, that is one side of him. That is the goodness of God. There is another side of God that is called the severity of God. If you know that part, then you will believe what Paul says when he said, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God because he is a consuming fire. God is too merciful to send anybody to hell. Are you sure you know him? Hell did not come by itself. It was God who prepared that place. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a shorty that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them 400 years. Now God was confirming, but I don't need to go into all of this. I just wanted to draw a thought from his experience as an illustration to show what Second Corinthians chapter 6 is actually saying. What Matthew 13 were also presenting. What happened in Genesis chapter 3 as well when the devil came against the world. The instruction that God gave to Adam and Eve. Same thing, same devil, no new tricks, same old tricks. And the Bible says we should not be ignorant of the devices of the devil. Let me explain this. Can you imagine at a moment in which righteousness was imputed into a man who believed God? At a moment in which God had made a promise and the man demanded Something that will make him something he can hold on to. And then God caught a covenant because that's what that was, was a covenant act. So God caught a covenant to prove to him and assure him that what he has said, the promise he had made, he'll bring to pass. Now, the moment while Abraham was preparing for the covenant of God, for the presence of God to come because God was going to come and pass between the divided pieces. While he was preparing for the coming of God's presence, what came? The fowls of the air. Why did they come? They came to defile the sacrifice. The devil always shows up just before your breakthrough. Why does he do that consistently? Because he's a thief. Because he comes to steal. Because he hates you. And his greatest desire is to destroy your relationship with God. And to make sure that you get a portion with him in the house of torment that God prepared for him and the fallen angels. God didn't prepare hell for man. Oh, look at, look at many of us 
I've I prayed, I've talked to God, I'm the righteousness of God. You have quoted all that you are. I'm the light. And this is what God's word says concerning my destiny. This is what God's word says concerning what I'm going to become tomorrow. This is the instruction that God has given. And then, you know, with every promise, there is a condition attached. Just while you are working your way to that promise, to the fulfillment or the actualization of the promise of God, then the devil shows up. Has God said, must you really obey? Did you not hear that some other pastor, that bishop, that apostle, that prophet said that this is the real interpretation so you don't have to go this way? This one is too strict. This is not of God. Who do you think is speaking? He's the devil. What does he want? To push you away. What must you do when the fowls raise up their ugly head? Drive them away. Are you still here with me? What did I say you should do? What did Abraham do? The Bible says that you must walk in the faith of Abraham. Follow the steps of Abraham's faith. Follow the steps of Abraham's faith. Follow the steps of Abraham's faith. There was a limitation. Abraham, the person that God promised that would, that, that, that uh, well, Abraham made a promise to Abraham that your children would be like the stars in the heaven. He was married to a barren woman. He was 75 years old when God gave that promise to him. 25 years after, when it, he, God waited for Abraham's own body to die. So it was impossible for Abraham. The Bible says when he, his own body, was now dead. That's when God showed up. By this time next year, according to the time of life, you shall bring forth a son. Abraham was the first to laugh. Not Sarah. Then Sarah laughed. When Sarah laughed, what did God say? Oh, so this is a matter of laughing, right? All right. Your son shall be called laughter. And the Bible says he staggered not at the promise of God. But was strong in faith, believing. Beloved, there is only one way to attain the promise of God. Be strong. Did you hear me? Be what? Strong in what? In faith. Strong faith means that the natural, the, sens sen the evidence of the senses don't move you. What you see, hear, touch, taste does not move you. What moves you is what God's word says. People will laugh at you. They will say all kinds of things about you. You are foolish. You are not wise. You should show discretion in matters like this. Don't become a fanatic. But if you are holding on to God's word, hold on to it. Are you following this? That's the only language the fowls understand. You drive them away. See what the Bible says in Mark chapter uh, 16. Let's read from verse 15. Drive them away. The fowls will come. They will come. Some translations say that those fowls are actually vultures. Whatever they are, it doesn't really matter. The devil is the devil. Jesus told us he's the devil. Amen. Amen. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth, he that does what? So are we still talking about the same people the Bible was referring to in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? 
believers and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And read everybody and start again and start again. This what signs, yeah, continue shall follow them that believe. Now, hold on. These signs we follow believers. It's not talking about you. I just want you to understand that, that so that you understand the scriptures in the right, right, because uh, it's not talking about you. And these signs shall follow the apostles. What are you saying? And these signs shall follow the prophets. And these signs shall follow your pastors. And these signs shall follow whom? Them that believe. Are you a believer? Yeah. Then expect the signs to follow you. Now notice the very first thing he says. Read on. In my name shall they, they shall drive out fowls. I'd like you to put it that way. And in my name shall they drive out the fowls. Are you hearing me? Those fowls that come to steal the word from producing its fruit in your life. And in my name shall they cast out devils. Why did he start with that? Because they are your number one enemy. They stand as your number two enemies. They are also at the bottom of the list of your enemies. From start to finish, there is no human being who is your enemy. You just have people who are motivated by this enemy to act in certain ways against you. And that's why the Bible says the weapons of your warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty through whom? God to the Pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Because in your mind the devil can sow wrong thoughts. The devil gives dreams too just as God sends dreams. Every dream you dream is not from God. You must understand that. So my dreams come to pass. And then you had a dream. Test the spirit of the dream. Is it consistent with the promise of God's word? Because if the devil wants to, wants to sow a thought in your mind, that's an easy way to, to do it. Psalm 55, it, was, it says, look, if it was an enemy, ah, I know what I would have done. I would not have even allowed the enemy to come that close. He said, but this was a familiar friend, somebody close, somebody who we eat together, feed together. The devil can use your friends. That's why you have to be careful what you hear. Are you still here with me? Bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and having the readiness to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Believers have become too lily livered. And that must not be your portion. We need to become strengthened. It's not everything that money solves. It's not every situation that you even need counsel for. When you have the word of God, go to the word. Go to the word. As many as are led by 
The spirit of God. They are the sons of God. Sons of God. Children of God. Are spirit led children. God speaks to them. They hear. Jesus Christ said my sheep. Hear my voice. They know it. And a stranger's voice. They will not follow. In my name. Drive the fowls away. Don't allow them to perch. And begin to eat. To eat up what? When it says they came to eat up the carcasses, don't forget that the carcass represented the instruction that God gave to him. And he was in the process of applying himself to the instructions. He was doing the instructions when the devil came to eat it up. In other words, to stop him from completing that which God wanted. These birds are unclean. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, they shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. Praise God. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Let's close. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Let's read on. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. Say the Lord Jesus. Does that make sense now? Yes. Say the Lord Almighty. Let's read the next verse. Having therefore these what? Promises. Dearly beloved. Drive out. Drive out the vultures. Drive out the fowls. Are you following this? Let us do what? Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting what? Holiness in the fear of God. James 4, 4 and verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist who? And did Abraham received, receive the birds? What happened to the birds? They flew away. Receive the devil and First Peter chapter 5. Yeah, it says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he sh ye shall receive, what shall ye receive? A crown of glory that... Say it again, say it again. Everybody read this verse, yes? If you're a believer, if you're a believer, if you're righteous, if you're light, if you belong to Christ, if you are the temple of God, don't say ye, say I. So read it again. Say it again, say it again. Let's say it one more time. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, I shall receive a crown of glory that faded not away. So let us see what he says you must do in the interim. Let's read on verse 5. He says, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yeah, all of you, be subject one to another and be clothed with what? Humility. For God does what? Resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Now, let's read, everybody. 
Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. I, now I'd like you to say, my due season will be what? An exaltation. Now say, I will be exalted in my due season because I am humbling myself under the verse 7. Let's see. Casting all your care on him. For he careth for you. God bless you.